Okay, so we're good to go. So first, I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Hines, for taking a part uh, in our Armstrong High School uh, Black History Month. Um, for us, we wanted to think outside the box and introduce our student body and, and parents as well of Black leaders that are right here in our community um, that are doing positive things, that are that are making a change, that, that are doing certain things. So um, we want to thank you for that. Um, we also have Caitlin, uh, one of our seniors here, that is going to take part in this process with us. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to her so she can introduce herself and we can get started. Hello, um, I'm a senior here at Armstrong High School. Um, some things I'm a part of here are I'm in National Honor Society. I'm the communications leader. Um, I'm the student class president um, in student council. Um, I enjoy tutoring my peers and younger elementary students in my free time. I also enjoy like traveling and adventuring. Um, after high school, I plan to either go to California or stay in Minnesota and go to the University of Minnesota and hopefully pursue a, or a major in biochemistry or biology. That's a little bit about myself. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey, Caitlin, go ahead and take it away and, and okay. from there. All right. So first question we have for you today is, what would you consider to be your greatest life accomplishment? So first, let me say that I am not a leader. I'm an educational activist. So when you ask me what my life's greatest accomplishment is, that's too many to name. However, uh, it's working with BIPOC students and also African-American Black students and going against the miseducation of a system that wasn't designed for us, but educating all to so we can build that collectivism. You know, being the director of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. program, we talk about the beloved community. However, the beloved community can sometimes be miseducated about how we bring about current collectivism and bring in a asset-based model instead of a deficit-based model of cultural wealth. And thinking about you, Caitlin, about other BIPOC students, and what is the familial, community, linguistic, social, and cultural capital that all our students bring to the table for a better understanding. It's good to talk about similarities, but our differences is what makes us unique around diversity. And if we're not talking about our differences and how we see each other from a victor's lens, then what is the next step? How do we have that truth to get to reconciliation and healing amongst groups that have been excluded through basic laws and acts, which is also a part of structural, systemic, and institutional racism. I 100% agree with everything you said. Um, on to our next question. Who is your role model or someone who has helped or inspired you to get to the places you are today and why? That's a good question too. There's been so many role models, uh, family or other scholars, especially black scholars and other scholars of color in my life. That's a hard question to ask right away and nothing against the questions. Can I change it up just a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. So let me tell you a little bit about myself first. I am um, African-American, Catawba Indian and Caucasian. So in the South, I'm called the product of miscegenation, which means that one eighth this, one eighth that. <clears throat> Growing up during segregation, I've been called everything from a mulatto, octoroon, quadroon. Um, I was thrown away by my bi biological parents and social services gave me to a black family, African-American family. This family adopted me and made me one of their own. So. They are my role models. They're my inspiration because growing up doing segregation, we didn't fully integrate in South Carolina until 1969. So kindergarten, 
head start first and second grade. I had all African American female teachers that went to HBCUs that brought this knowledge back to us in the classroom as a first and second grader. However, that education was supplemented by the black church and teaching us about us in the Bible as well. Uh, I grew up on the Old Testament grew up on the New Testament, so different meanings behind each. They taught me about the African diaspora, the people in the Bible, the greatness that we come from, the inventions that was in Africa that was brought to this country by stolen people and enslaved people. So my, my mother, my father taught me how to read, taught me how to spell, taught me math, even though my mother only had an eighth grade education, my father had a 12th grade education. The community back then for me was a lot different than when I got to integration where we became inferior based on another story. We learned all the stories, but what impacts me the most is, again, my parents and my family and my current family. So there's a lot of, these pieces of the puzzle become complex because sometimes what you're taught may not always be the truth. And then that what is called cognitive distance comes into play. When I give you new information, you may struggle with that based on what you haven't been taught. So that goes back to the miseducation of Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the miseducation of the Negro. So there, it is so complex because you have people that come in and out your life, no matter what socially constructed race they are, that you are able to learn from. So I learn from them, you learn from me. So where I'm at today is because of them. I, I didn't know until six years ago that my mother was part of the civil rights movement in South Carolina, where she did a lawsuit and President Kennedy and some others came to South Carolina to look at the discrimination that was going on. And we don't hear a lot of these stories because still black people, African-American people are still feeling some type of way about the civil rights movement. And they don't share those stories with our young people because then we're getting to, I'm sorry, we're getting to this ain't your mama civil rights movement. A lot of these movements are based on the same concepts of inequities and injustices. Thank you. Um, that answers our question 100%. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next question does kind of connect to something that we've already touched on, but um, tell us a little bit more about yourself or your background, what high school and college you attended, and what you are currently doing for your career at the University of Minnesota. So I attended Spartanburg High School in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, I graduated high school with a 1.9 GPA, and I was told that I wasn't college material. So instead of being a street pharmaceutical sales representative, I decided to go into the United States Air Force. Have you ever seen the movie Boys in the Hood? Furious would say there's no place for a black man in Uncle Sam's military. However, we have been fighting for this country all our lives since 1778 and the Rhode Island First Regiment that was conscripted by President Washington or General Washington at that time because he was running out of white troops. So we've been in every war in this country. So I joined the United States Air Force Security Forces. I served 15 years. Um, I had a white man, Dr. Paul Phillips, I used to patrol his house, be his kind of uh, personal assistant. When I was getting out of the military, say, Alex, uh, well, let me go back. I'm on post and there comes a call through the radio. Uh, Sergeant Hines, uh, there's a Dr. Paul Phillips to speak with you. Like, what do you want? So when I got there, he said, I know you're getting out of the military. I'm like, how do you know that? He says, you're going to come work for me and you're going to get an education. I said, I don't have ACT or SAT schools. He says, no problem. Your first year, you must maintain a 2.75 GPA with the University of Maryland European Division while you're working full time. First year, 3.95 GPA from a 1.9 in high school. So he was part of this, con this journey on my, uh, to edu higher education or education in general. So I did graduate from the University of Maryland uh, 3.65 GPA. I have a master's from Clemson University with a 3.9 GPA. And I have been doing this work in higher ed for going on, I think this is my 30, my year 31 in higher ed. 
So I'm a little bit older. So my career path today is uh, right now I work at the University of Minnesota, uh, the College of Liberal Arts. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and inclusion, and I'm also the director of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. program and the President's Emergence Scholars program in the College of Liberal Arts. Thank you. Um, next question, can you share any advice for high school students who are trying to figure out their own path in life? Difficult question again, because everyone's different. Everyone comes from different social economic status, being a first generation college student like myself, different ethnicities, different cultures. My advice would be shift your paradigm. And as I tell students, they say, Mr. Hines, what is a paradigm? I say, it's not when you rub two nickels together and get a pair of dimes. It's a frame of view, it's a point of reference that ACTs and SATs are not indicators of your success to get into to college. What well, I need students to think about while they're still in high school, I need for you to focus on that GPA. Some community service would be good, but now that the United States is kind of going to this holistic review process and admissions, where SATs and ACTs will be considered, I need for you to focus on that GPA because that GPA is a better indicator of success than a standardized test score, because all of us do not have the same privilege and access to certain information. Our parents are not getting information that they need for their, their child with intersecting identities to be successful in this educational system. So that's my, instead of, let me put it this way, in college, we tell you when you get to the university, for every hour you spend in the classroom, you need to spend three hours outside of the classroom. So if you're taking 16 credit hours, that's 48 hours a week. That's like you as a student, Caitlin. You're a full-time state employee. You go to school 37.5 hours a week. The average high school students, according to a lot of the research, only studies five to seven hours a week. So we're asking you to shift that mindset. If you do it now, you won't have to worry about it when you get to higher ed. And that GPA, like I said, it's gonna be the best indicator of success for a holistic review process. So, you know, I could go and break down all the numbers for you of students in Minnesota. It's not a uh, condemnation on public education, but Sister Principal Weir knows the numbers out there, the ACT, the SAT data. But if we can just change that mindset, oh man, we, we would just be dangerous. And there would be more access. Thank you. Um, I agree with that. As someone who is a first generation college student, I definitely wish I knew some of those like important things and how to start. I wish I started a long time ago, but um, thank you. Uh, as a yeah. leader in the black, oops, sorry. Someone... Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, our next question, as a leader in the black community, what advice do you have for high school students as they prepare for their post high school lives? So I know this is Black History Month. I'll reiterate, I'm not a leader in the Black community. I'm a leader, what I think is with students. Uh, when you go to my Facebook page, if you go to my Facebook page, you will see that there are majority students that are on my Facebook page for, from every, all the seven institutions I have worked at. And my advice to all students, but I'm, since it's Black History Month, I'm going to go with Black students, African-American students first. Um, and I don't know if you all learn this in your public education. Again, never blaming public education. I blame higher education or put the onus, not blame, put the onus back on them to prepare pre-service teachers to come in and work with different students based on the courses that they need to take. So when I think about this, and African-American students, I'm gonna give you a quote, Stephen Bantu Biko, which a lot of students don't learn about. They learn about Nelson Mandela and the apartheid movement. Stephen Biko says, being black is not a matter of pigmentation. Being black is a reflection of a mental attitude. There are all types of disruptions and distractions that impacts that knowledge that we're not 
um, employing two black students. So a lot of people say information is knowledge and knowledge is power. No, information is knowledge, applied knowledge is power to make well-informed decisions for life. So when I'm thinking about BIPOC students in general, I'm always curious about when you're upholding your cultural and ethnic identity, what have you learned and how the system has played the oppression Olympics with you by not teaching you sometimes the different acts that did not and currently does not provide you the access to knowledge of self. So that would be my advice. Respect, I, I know cultures are difficult. Cultures can become patriarchal. Cultures, your parents might say, well, stop talking back to me. You're upholding this Western society. You're upholding this media. But this is what is put in front of you without having the ability sometimes to say, I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of my name. I'm proud of where I come from. But here are some of the distractions to survive in this country that I've learned. So just, just a little bit different response based on who I work with as well. I can't be exclusive, I have to be inclusive and that doesn't mean everybody, words are co-opted. Inclusion means the intentional and ongoing engagement in the curricula and co-curricula to promote cognitive ways of knowing about all of us. Thank you, that was a very unique answer. Um, our last question to wrap things up um, for me, what's your life's mission or what is your why? I bet sister principal, Brother Ware came up with that one. Brother Ware, you watched a brother who talks about that on the stage and the music with Amazing Grace. <laughs> I, I thought so. So there's a why for me. It is how I walk in purpose. And I'm a man. I have made mistakes. Uh, hopefully that I make amend for those mistakes through truth and healing and reconciliation. But my, my passion is to walk in purpose, is to be that educational person, that person that you can come to for some other type of information, that person that has that empathy, congruence and unconditional positive regard. So when I talk about empathy, I can't put myself in your shoes, but I have to have that mindset to be able to realize the conditions that people are in. Congruence, being genuine. You young people know when we're not genuine, when we're fake, because some of us don't keep it 100. We keep it about 35 to 45, right? And that unconditional positive regard is a, a Eurocentric saying, you only get uh, first, what was it? First impressions, the last impressions. You never get a second chance. We're walking in purpose. I believe that students need second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth chances. But we kind of use models and paradigms that don't reflect how we need to do that. So it's the walk in purpose. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nice job, Caitlin. So we're almost we're almost done here. Um, we got the quick fire section. Um, so you know the challenge is one word or one sentence, um, and we'll, we'll get it going here. So what brings you the most joy right now? Uh, my black queen and family, because without her, I probably wouldn't be here today. That's so much oh, grace for go. me. So sorry. It, you ask me questions that I can go on about. So my wife and my family, my African queen and my family. Thank you. Two, what do you want your family to think of when they hear your name? Sorry. Uh, the roots would say, there I go from a man to a memory. How will my fam remember me? I want them to remember me as that educational activist who had grace, compassion for what people are experiencing. Thank you. Okay, this one, three, your favorite cartoon growing up? When I was growing up doing segregation, cartoons were racist. If you get a chance, watch the Tim Racist cartoons in America. My brother introduced me to comic books. So the Black Panther came out in 1966, not in the movie. So reading comic books was my substitute for cartoons. 
Thank you. The book that has had the greatest impact on you. Sorry, there's two. There's uh, Dr. Ted Williams, The Disruption of Black Civilization, and Dr. Naeem Akbar, the nation's preeminent psychologist for a while, Know Thyself. Thank you. And then you kind of touched, you touched on this throughout, right? So the one is your one message that you would tell all high school students if you had to sum it up in one word or one sentence. I know you touched all through the, through the interview, but here it goes one more time. <laughs> <laughs> know thyself and be proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey, no, we, we definitely appreciate you just taking the time with us and, and just educating us. I mean, you know, you dropped a, a lot of knowledge on us and, and I know our student body is going to learn something in, in our teachers and in our, in our parents that are going to listen to this and follow along. So I want to thank you. Kayla, I want to also thank you as well. You done, did a good job. Um, I'm going to stop recording for a second. I want to Brother Ware, may I add one more thing? No, definitely. So this is Black History Month, right? So yeah. kind of dispel the myths of Black History Month right quick. Yep. History Month, people think is we get the shortest month of the year. Black History is 24-7, 365. However, Dr. Carter G. Woodson is the fall of the Black History Month, which started in 1926 with Omega Sapphire Fraternity and Negro Achievement and Literature Week to recognize all the contributions and achievements that African Black Americans have made to this country. And we still make those contributions 24 7 365. Oh, and it's because of Abraham Lincoln's birthday and Frederick Douglass as well, but that's a deeper class to talk about or conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 